on today's episode of Bucked Up. I just think the more you can get young people uh, into places like the venues, not just ours, but to see live entertainment. It doesn't just have to be comedy, but music, concerts. It could be the ballet. It could be the theater. It could be... Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. But when I was watching your interviews, uh, as I said, I used to come here when I was a kid. Yeah, every yeah. Every single weekend. And I heard you talk about how much you loved comedy as a kid. And I was like, oh shit, I'm not nervous. Like, this is, this is what no, I'm like, I, I love it. And now my, my boys, well, we can talk about it. I mean, my boys, they're 16 and 17, and they come here all the time. And they bring their friends, and oftentimes it's their friends' first time mm -hmm. ever seeing a live comedy show. Yeah. You know? And it's great. It's amazing. Know? They'll never forget it. That's one of my favorite compliments I get, is because I have a lot of rap fans come. Yeah, yeah. They're like, I've never been to a comedy show before, and this is my first one. And that's like, that might warm my heart anything else. It's like the first time I, I never forget my first stand up comedy show. It just fell in love. Did you want to do it? I've heard you tell that story about your first one, but did you want to do it when you saw it for the first time? Are we on right now? Yeah, I would, we start wherever. We oh, okay. Wherever. <laughs> <laughs> I, not that I would say anything differently. Oh, did I ever want to do comedy? Yeah, like when you first saw it, though. It might have been a fleeting thought, uh, but I always wanted to be on the radio instead. Yeah, you know, I wanted to be on. Wanted to be a broadcaster. Uh, I actually went to broadcasting school in the middle of my nine-year sojourn through, through uh, higher ed uh, after graduating high school. But uh, no, I, and I never even thought I'd be working in comedy. I just, it just happened by accident. But it happened because I was working at a radio station. And uh, Maddie in the morning, I used to run the AM station. The music of your life, 1430. The music coming off. It was, oh, really? It was big band music. <laughs> Maybe like 11 people listening to it. And I'd work overnight, do the board. Music coming off satellite, and I have to play the commercials, like every whatever. And then I just go hang around with the overnight jock, uh, the FM jock, and hang out with them and talk to them and just listen to music. And, and then have to answer the phone at the front desk and then open the door for Maddie's guests in the morning. So Dick Darty was coming in. And, uh, you know, my parents used to, go, used to follow him all the time. Uh, so I entered, he was coming on to promote his new comedy show, his new comedy club. Right down the street here, it was on a boat, light ships, next to the milk bottle at the Children's Museum. And uh, I was just at the Federal Reserve building for an event two weeks ago, and I had a perfect view. I took a picture of the site where the boat was, the milk bottle, and then right up the street, it's like the grid here, is, is Laugh Boston. Wow. How old were you? Uh, that was 1992, so I was, I was 22 years old. So was your passion in music? Oh, God, no. No, I wanted to be... I, 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 lived, I lived for talk radio. Oh, I was probably the only okay. six-year-old listening to talk radio. Yeah. And sports radio wasn't a thing, and I love sports, but it, sports radio was not the 24-hour thing that it is today. It was just in segments. It was on at night. So you'd have to, like, I'd listen to WITS 1510, the wits end of your dial, and uh, it would fade in and out of frequency, the AM station, uh, depending on what the weather was like. And, uh, and then I'd listen to WBZ overnight. They had some great talk show hosts, Norm Nathan and uh, David Brednoy and Bob Raleigh and Larry Glick. And people for, and WBZ at night, on a clear night, goes out to 38 states. Uh, and so people from all over the country, or at least from Ohio in, would call in to WBZ overnight and just, just talking about goofy stuff. It's the know? same as a podcast. Oh, talk radio ex exactly, podcast exactly. And it's just sort of like, just long form people having a conversation yeah. and talking. You know, it's 2.30 in the morning, where are you going to be? You know, just I'll, I'll keep you on the air for 20 minutes if you want to. That's we can funny. talk about it. That's why you're a good storyteller. You're a really good storyteller, but you don't do stand-ups. Damn, yeah. why is that? No, like, I just yeah, always... It's because of talk radio. Maybe it is because of talk radio, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm somewhat verbose, you know. I, I used to love, you know, performing in, in, in school stuff yeah. and just kind of... I was always the shortest and the youngest. I was born on August 31st, so I made my grade by literally uh, 14 hours. 
<laughs> like one more day. I'm a July 17th, so yeah. I, I was young. Too. So you can relate, right? So I was always yeah. the tiniest, the shortest, blah, blah, blah. And my mother always wished she kept me back, you know, because I just wasn't mature enough. But my defense mechanism, you know, being a tiny guy was, you know, when you know, the bullies came after you, was, to, was humor. That was like kind of the deflection. Yeah. Was kind of to, you know, and, you know, the, the, sh the show, I used to watch the gong show with my father all the time. And, I mean, God knows I've seen, I've seen every MASH episode, I think, 74 times. Every single one. You gotta you know? get to seventy-five. Oh my God! I just like I can't. A, my OCD. When you I said can tell you. I don't know. Some why. characters. <laughs> some people in Mash have played three different characters over the course of the thing. You know, uh, they're a general in one episode, then they're a, they're an operating nurse in the uh, you know in another episode yeah. uh, three years later. But uh, yeah, that, when people complain about AI actors, I feel like it's the same as reusing actors. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. So I, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, but I remember that that first time. Seeing comedy, I was a junior at, at, in high school, and me and my friend Gary Diomede, who I'm still friends with to this day, and his brother Peter, his older brother Peter, the three of us went to Nick's Comedy Stop in 1986, and we saw uh, it was it was Kevin Knox hosting, it was DJ Has in the middle, and then Don Gavin, who was from my street in West Roxbury, I mean this guy, and then Steve Sweeney came in up and did a guest set off the street for 10 minutes and we all knew Sweeney because he was on, he was like a TV star, like a local TV yeah. star, you know? And it was, and he was always on the radio uh, doing impersonations on the talk radio station on WRKO. And we walked out of there and I'm like, what have, it was like, like kind of like Alice in Wonderland, like we walked out and like, did we just see what we thought we saw? But why, why did you love that as an art form? Do you, why just do you that, that, like that kind of live, it was just unpredictable. Like what's, what, what's happening here? It's, this person, did they, it's almost like, and they, oh, the, the, those, those guys almost seemed like it was just coming off, like, like it wasn't rehearsed. Like they we were just would. having a conversation with you. It was a one-sided conversation, but they were just, and it was just, to us, it was like, it wasn't scripted. There wasn't a laugh track in the back, like the sitcoms we used to watch. You know, even if stuff wasn't funny, you'd hear these canned laughs. There was nothing, and if there was no, if the joke falls flat, there's no can left to save you. Yeah. It's crickets. And, and so it just, uh, we walked out. And then Gary and I, subsequently, <laughs> we would go to Nick's Comedy Stop. We would bring dates to, when we started dating new girls, the best barometer, I think, on was to, if they laughed, at the, if they the, she had a similar sense of humor you did, then you knew you had a winner. Well, you can't really tell at the movie theater. You're sitting in the dark and you're like... I think Joanne's met every girlfriend I've ever had. Most likely, yeah. All, you bring them all in here, yeah. I started dating at 16. I yeah, think, I mean, bring them all in, of course. I bring them, the you bring them for a date, you know. I really do think she's... Probably, That's probably. Hilarious. And we'd go and... That's so funny. We'd have $4 off coupons uh, in the Herald. And Gary and I would bring, like, two girls and we'd go. And so we'd say... Uh, We'd go up and Bobby was the, uh, the owner, he did the tickets, he was a grump, but he was a hot of gold. And uh, he'd say, okay, it's gonna be $8, we put up the coupons, he'd go, oh, coupons? I'm like, tamp it down, tamp it down. <laughs> you can't even <laughs> <on a> <laughs> No, because we'd have the girls on the side. Shh, keep it low. And so uh, that way we had enough money for a, for a couple of beers, you know? And so, <laughs> yeah. um, it's a, but we just would go all the time to Nick's Comedy Stop to go to go see, we'd see who the ads were. It, they, the, there used to be one full page in the Boston Herald dedicated to all the clubs in Boston and in suburban Boston on who was coming in. All of them. Like if you weren't in there, you didn't really have a club. You well, know, it was sort of like, that was the real deal. I, the reason, all right, so I'll give you like the whole backstory a little bit. The reason I liked comedy is I was like a shy kid. Yeah. So it was crazy to see people talking their mind. Sure. That's what I liked about it when I said, were you like a shy kid growing up? Were you? Not particularly, no, no. no. But I was like, I, I'm the oldest of six. And so um, my sister, who was, uh, we were eight months apart. Uh, I'm the oldest, but she was, she was premature, obviously, uh, by three months. I don't know we were particularly close, um, but you know, she was a big reason for you know things later on in my life, but um, due to a, a tragedy that involved her that we can talk about. But I, um, 
but my my next brother was six years older, so I was kind of like, I almost felt like I was an only child sometimes. Mm. And my my parents had uh, my parents worked hard. They my mother still does. My dad passed away about seven years ago, eight years ago. Um, he was a construction worker, and then he worked two nights a week, you know, at a liquor store. Uh, you know, by the time he got home, he was just exhausted. Yeah. You know, it just he's out there pounding nails and building staging in the cold or the heat, and it's just so you know. And, and he's up at every morning, 4.30 in the morning. He's on the job site by 6, 6.30. So, you know, he busted his ass. And so my mother did a home daycare. But they were also uh, foster parents. So we probably had 30 different foster kids over the years uh, in our home. Oh, wow. And you were the oldest. And I was the oldest. So it was kind of like, uh, and my, I'm a senior in high school. And my, I come home and my parents sit me down and tell me that my mother's pregnant with my sister. I was 17 years old at Catholic yeah. Memorial. I, I've got to go out and tell my friends that my parents are still doing this stuff, right? It's sort of like it was like it was like I was yeah. explaining that like aliens. But to them. that's why you like not doing comedy but wrangling comedy. It's yeah, like yeah, yeah, wrangler. yeah. I was a wrangler, you, were you know. Like a but I mean, you were... oh, I tell I used to tell my brother and sister they should build a statue of me, you know, on the front lawn in homage because <laughs> I think parents just get exhausted the more kids they have, you know, everything's that the attention's paid to the you know the first couple especially the first one and then it kind of it wanes but they were strict they were strict with me but I just found my my refuge was kind of like was my transistor radio listen to the Red Sox at night uh, you know play by play on my little transistor radio listen to talk radio and then you know just watching comedy shows where I could uh, my parents had the Steve Martin album uh, wild and crazy guy you know, we, late 70s you know 70, 77 78 my parents used to have parties in their basement it was a it was a garage that they converted into like a party basement with rug samples. They didn't have enough money for a rug, so they went out and borrowed got rug samples from all these oh, different rug companies. Yeah, we want to test that one out and test so it was just a cobble and together. But it, was, it ended up being pretty cool. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were they were so far ahead of their time. So and it was like they built my father was a uh, a, a mason's assistant, so it was all brickwork with like white brick and mirrors inlaid and so they'd have parties and, you know, booze down there and and listening to the radio, listening to the oldie station, and then they would listen to records. They listen to Steve Martin. They would have I, comedy parties. They'd have comedy parties and listening parties and so and then back this is way before the internet, way before anything, but there used to be dirty jokes on paper that people used to pass around. It'd be like grab like it'd be like dirty peanuts. Be like Charlie Brown doing something, you know, uh, just really wrong for Peanuts characters, you know, <laughs> with another character, with you know, on, you know, with Lucy or something, you know, and and, and just this. But they would pass. You could hear, you, they would pass it on the papers, and people would read the jokes, you mm -hmm. know, or someone would read the jokes off the page. And so I was in my feet pajamas, and I wasn't allowed to go down. The, so, but I go at the top. I could hear them laughing. You could hear from the top of the stairs, and so I would listen when my parents went out in the backyard or whatever. I'd sneak down and put the record on. And listen to Steve Martin. And to me, that I really didn't even know what he looked like, save for the bun he was in a bunny suit, like this fuzzy bunny suit on the on yeah. the cover, with the rabbit ears. And I didn't really know what he looked like, but I just imagined in my mind, kind of like the radio, like the I didn't know what any of these talk show hosts looked like, and I just imagined what they looked like in my head, and just kind of and just but the thought of that person, it sounded like Steve Martin was in front of thousands of people, and just. To come to stand there on a stage and command a few thousand people and have them listen to every word he was saying, that was captivating to but me. But you didn't want to do it. No, I never really wanted to do it outside of, I don't know if I was scared to do it or I just kind of found my, I, again, I wanted, I was aiming to be a broadcaster and, but I, and I went to broadcasting school and, but they told me, you know, that, they told me I was I was pretty good at it, but with my accent, I wouldn't get a job outside of Dorchester. And you know, when you come out of broadcasting school, if you really want it, you have to leave to come home again. So you know, I don't know the thought of you know doing radio broadcasts of eighth grade volleyball from Bangor, Maine, really didn't didn't really appeal to me at the time. So you think about that through line, though. Like you throw comedy parties now. Yeah, <laughs> like I do often. Yeah, often I think about it all the time. Um, and that's why, you know, how we were saying at the outset, you know, 
I remember that very first time when I was there and how it, that, that literally, that time at Nick's Comedy Stuff literally changed my life. Mm -hmm. uh, opening the door for Dick Doherty changed my life. Um, and, uh, and, and now when I take my boys uh, to this club or to laugh or to any other clubs that we run um, and have them interact with comedians who I think are just, I, I think they're the most brilliant people around. Um, they've all got their different styles, but they just, they just question like the complete absurdity of life and, and make you think differently. And I, you know, it's, it's, it gives you a whole new perspective on things. And so for my boys to see that and then to bring their friends in and they say, and I, I can see their faces. Some of them say, well, I, that was awesome. I can't wait to come back. And so then they come back, you know, and then more kids hear about it and they want to come in. I just think the more you can get young people uh, into places like the venues, not just ours, but to see live entertainment, it doesn't just have to be comedy, but music, concerts, it could be the ballet, it could be the theater, it could be, you know, I went to, I kind of, I was away a couple of times uh, a couple weeks ago, so I kind of drew the short straw and took my wife to go see Frozen. I've never seen the movie before, um, uh, and but I love live theater, and it was great. It was great. I mean, this is, these are Broadway. I mean, it's, it's really great. Uh, and having never seen the movie before, I was kind of surprised and stuff like that. Um, but the place was loaded with kids, and for they were giving out buttons. This is my first Broadway play, and they made a special acknowledgement about that at the beginning, for that for hundreds of people in that audience, it was the first, uh, particularly the kids. It was the first thing they'd ever seen anything live yeah. on stage outside of like a fourth grade play, you know. My parents would take me to the Lion King musical on Broadway. Yeah. Like once a year we'd make the trip for that. And it's funny, like my dad's a drummer and he plays at like bars and does shows uh, sure. from Ken from Cape Cod originally. What part? Uh, Chatham. Nice. Yeah. We have a place in Dennis Point. Oh, really? Yeah, All right. yeah. So my dad lives in Mashpee, so he plays on Cape a lot. But it is funny, like seeing him go out helped me go out too. Like kids need experiences because I don't think, a lot of people just have never experienced the thing so they don't know how much joy that'll bring them. Absolutely. If that, if that makes sense. It totally makes sense. I, I say to my boys all the time, uh, particularly if they get glued to TikTok or you know, these phones, and believe me, I'm just as, I carry two of them like an idiot. Um, uh, they. They can be the best things in your life, but sometimes they're, they can be the worst things. And I tell my boys all the time, I said, look at guys, when you're playing in an under 30 beer league hockey game at 11 o'clock at night, and then you go out in the parking lot to have a couple of cold ones, you're not gonna be talking about TikTok videos you saw when you're 14 years old, yeah. when you're 17 years old. You're gonna be talking about experiences and things that happened with your friends who were live, that were, you know, they were out in the world and stories. That's what makes, and that's what makes you interesting. You know, yeah. you acquire these stories along the way, and then you share them with other people. You may exaggerate them some way to to make them funny or embellish them, or but they're stories, and only you have those stories, right? And yeah. When you hear like old, like when you see people either in movies or in real life, like if you talk to very old people, like close to death. They say their biggest regret is not like living more. Living. And that always stuck with me. That's why I was happy my parents would let me come here. Like, yeah. Because when I saw that I could, that's why I like not having a studio. I like going to someone's, I know this isn't your home, yes. but this is a place of yours and I like to have the experience with the person. Of course. Because a lot of people have never left their circle, so they don't know how easy it is to grow in the world. I'm, the, my only success in life came from putting myself in different positions. Of course. Leaving my home and, oh, if I go here, maybe they'll like me. Oh, maybe I can try doing five minutes here. And that's where it grows. Get out of your comfort zone. It's like Tony V used to say it all the time. He said, you know, there would be comics that say, I'm, I don't feel like I'm getting any better. And he says, he said, I'm not, he says, you're not going to get any better sitting on your couch. No one's gonna see you on your couch. Yeah. You know, uh, you may crack yourself up or your dog, 
but you're gonna get off your couch, you're gonna get out there in the world and you, like go up and do the five minutes at the Elks Club where it seems like it's a hostile crowd and like get out there in, in different experiences, but do different things, go, you know, like Anthony Bourdain used to say, you know, he has the saying, you know, like, you're in a town, go to the, go to the, uh, go to the Greasy Spoon and have the breakfast special. Go to the dinner place and sit by yourself and have a beer and in uh, the local food or what's there. Have those experiences, you know. I was just, I was in Maine the other night for work uh, in Portland. So I had the night was uh, on my own. And so I went down to the, the, uh, the seafood place on the boat there, the famous place. Now I'm drawing a blank on what the name of it is, but it's been there forever. The big, big boat. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah right on the water there on the left. I should, uh, forgive me. Uh, the place is legendary, and you have to walk through like a hallway, get on the boat, and go down. It reminds me of Light Ships, because Light Ships, my first comedy club that I worked at was a boat. And uh, I didn't realize it was, it was actually on a boat for the first two weeks. Sometimes I'd walk down into work, and then when I left, I'd, left, I'd have to walk up a hill, and I'm like, it didn't really dawn on me that we were actually. It was, I never got that as a business structure. Maybe as a business <laughs> that you can, or like building a, your restaurant on a boat. Like that just doesn't seem smart, or just doesn't seem like the long. Yeah, yeah. well, the club only lasted a year, so maybe you have, you're onto something. But I, uh, but so I, I went. I had the. I'm looking at the menu. I'm like, why wouldn't you have the lobster roll? And why wouldn't I have the clam chowder? And why wouldn't I have the local IPA? That's what I'm gonna do. And then the Ali Foreman fight was on television, the Rumble and Jungle from 1974 in Zaire is on in its entirety. So the guy sitting next to me says, I remember this fight clearly, he was older than I was, and we started talking about it. Now we're watching the fight together. And then the bartender comes over, and we start watching the fight, we start talking about Ali and Foreman and all the great heavyweights from that time, and what we remember, and the whole, it was awesome. We watched yeah. the entire fight together, and we, Shook hands, we went on our way afterwards. But you also realize you've gotten to a place where you can do that. And I think most people listening to this are going to be comedians. Yeah. And I think most comedians don't realize that they have to be businessmen, too. You do. You do. It's a, it, like you have to be able to get to the point where you can buy yourself a lobster roll. But you can't just do that from being crazy. No. You have to be structured and crazy. Yep. You have to have some structure to that wildness that you are as a comedian. You push yourself out there, you might likely to find people who will buy you the lobster roll because and, and, they want your <laughs> company, right? Yeah, but and, how, and, what have you seen, like, what do you, why do you see comedians fall off? Like, it's... Well, I just, I, you know, it's like anything. It's, 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 it can be frustrating. It can be frustrating to go and to walk on water from a set and then go into a place and just completely fall on your face. And it's a hard, long game, you know, for, uh, for comics. It really is. And, but I was trying to, re I, people who talk to me about it and ask me my advice or whatever, the much as I can give it, I try and compare it to, I've never been a comic. I've stood on plenty of stages, but I've never had, I don't have prepared material or anything like that. Um, uh, I compare it, there was one, there was one comic, uh, I, fairly young comic in Boston who was pretty well known and I'm friendly with them. And um, I was running a half marathon in Plymouth. This is years ago. And I remember I was listening to their podcast and he was just way down, like not the usual joyful self. He was kind of way down. He was expressing that into the microphone and his frustration and blah, blah, blah. And I was jogging along and I'm like, what? I, was getting, I, was getting, I was getting angry at him. You know, and so I finished. The, I finished the slog along the half marathon. I finally get in my car and I'm driving. I, and I called him. I said, "Hey, look it." I said, "Lift your head up, yeah." And you know, I, I said, and what I compared it to him, and I said, "I've never been a comic." I said, "But I've run for office." You know, I, I and and I lost twice before I won. And I think the only thing I can come close to, you know, the the analogy is. To win office, a local office, you have to knock doors. I've knocked thousands of doors. If there was one time I could tell you the color of your house and the, and the color of the trim and the name of the chipmunk family that lived under your front porch. I mean, it, I knocked so many doors and rang so many doorbells. And, you know, if you can get someone to answer the door uh, because they simply don't want to answer the door, 
or they're having a fight with their spouse, or they get their kid in the tub, or they get dinner on the stove, or they're a third shifter and they're, t- and they're sleeping, you get them to come to that door, you've already won, and now you get like nine seconds to, to win them over, mm-hmm. to get them. But I guarantee you, uh, when all, when, as, uh, that conversation goes reasonably well, and that it could be nine seconds or it could be, it could be 25 minutes, they're voting for you on election day. They're voting for you because you're the only one doing it. You're the only one who came to their door and, and talked with them, listened to them, uh, and they're rooting for you. And I think it's the same thing with comics. I think, I think the nature of people, they come out, I mean, they come out to places like this, you know, especially in Boston and Massachusetts, there's so many things to go to. Um, your entertainment dollar only goes so far. You know, people have other expenses, and so, they choose us at a venue or any other venue, comedy venue. They want to root for the comedy. They want to have a good time. Yeah. They're not coming out to have a bad time. No, that's you know? why I hate seeing a comedian who's angry there on stage. You cannot be happy on stage. Like You can be sad, but when the audience can tell you don't want to be there, they're like, it's visceral because it's like... You should treat Kevin Knox, uh, who's you know been gone for some time now. It's hard to believe. But he would have this thing where he... His whole thing on, he didn't care if there were 2,000 people in the room or seven. They were getting a show and they were getting the full 100%. He wasn't, well, he didn't get, instead of getting mad at the people who, don't get mad at the people who are there. Yeah. You should be mad at the people who aren't there. The, the seven people who were there, they won a show. The first time I got booked in New York, I got booked to do Brooklyn Comedy Club and I get there and they're like, all right, you have to see people. I was like, oh, that wasn't the deal. And I'm like, I can't argue. I'm going to do the set. I see two people. And those are the two people there for the show. And it was, honestly, it was so much fun. I drove back that night. It was like seven hours of drive. You were part of show business. I loved it. I loved that. You were part of show business. Those are the, that was my first time in New York. I was like, if this is my first time, it's gonna. It's only up from here. You of know? course, of course. You've, you've, yeah. yeah, you just do what it takes to, to make it happen. Those two people came out. Yeah. And it's better than nobody there. Yeah. And at least they were there. And they'll, they'll never forget that either. They've never forgotten that. But what do, why do you see comedians fall off? Just because it's tough? Because I think you say you're not a comedian, but I think that means you have a better perspective of it. Because you see it as a business. Yeah, I, I, I do now. I mean, listen, there, there, are some, there are some days that I long for being the door guy again, you know? It was just kind of a simpler time, you know. I didn't have to worry about payroll or health insurance or leases or making, pay, you know, making payroll. How people are treated, you know, the, just not just the customers but the talent in the back of the house. There's just so many things that, you know, when we went to go open up this club, I remember calling uh, some veteran comics about best things I liked about a club. And if they're not done well, they're probably the worst things. You know, sounds, putting the bar in another area. Um, how you treat the comics, you know, off stage. Um, uh, but I also called some club owners, and I called Mike Lacey, who owns the Comedy Magic Store out in Hermosa Beach, and he's a legend, right? And he's owned that place for, for years. And I said, what's your best advice? He said, don't open a comedy club. <laughs> right? That was his yeah. advice to me, but uh, I'm glad we didn't listen to it, but it has its, it's a business now. Um, Do you regret the past? No, no, not one bit, I, not one bit. I, I love it. I, it this is, if, if I didn't like it, I just wouldn't do it anymore. Mm-hmm. I love the business, I love the people on both sides of the microphone. Uh, I love the opportunity to have a place where people can come and gather and just enjoy themselves and bring joy to their lives. Um, I didn't love COVID, nobody did, but I felt like we all had a responsibility, uh, producers and club owners and, and certainly was to put on shows for people. I mean, if I, don't get me wrong, if I have to put on another Zoom show, I'm gonna jump off a bridge. But we, or in a parking lot, or in a meadow, or in a drive-in movie theater, you know, you just had this, op- you felt like you had this, you're only making a nickel, but who cares? You were out of the house, you were getting people to gather, uh, you know, in a safe yeah. way, and then you were trying to keep the comic sharp in a little bit, you know, uh, it, in a, in a way, like on, being on a stage and just sort of, so they'd stay fresh and they say, but you know, so much, so much content was generated by comics at home. That's when I started my podcast. 
right? Yeah. That was your outlet to the world, right? I, I couldn't do stand up. I had like two years where no one listened to me. Sure. Like two years of that for no, no listening. But I bet it was cathartic to you. It was amazing. It and made you feel good. Now it's my full time job. This episode is sponsored by Infused Productions. They are the best in cannabis products and events. Make sure to follow them online at Infuse Productions. That's I N F. U Z E D Productions and check out what they have going on. Let's get back into it. Absolutely. Now I get uh, I got a half a million listeners, so it's pretty come on. So it's, pretty it's unreal. Congratulations to you. But it's, uh, do you think that? All right, I I do. Do you think COVID? Yes, it hurt businesses. Do you think that's the reason comedy is more open now? Because what comedy was going down a dark path before COVID. Well, 2020 was projecting to be our biggest year ever. Um, and, but I could see what you're saying. I, I, uh, if you look at the biggest comedians now, if they were saying those jokes pre-COVID, I feel like they would get in trouble. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. I, I think, um, listen, I think comedy clubs and maybe, I think one of, the, one of the last bastions of free speech left in the world, mm-hmm. I think when people come to a comedy club, they know it's going to be no holds barred. And it, what happens in these walls happens. That's why we don't allow, we, we discourage, you know, try to. That's why do not allow phones and people to record shows. That's why a lot of big comics have people bag their phones. There's two reasons for that. They don't want five seconds of material out of a 45 minute act to go out into the ether and it's taken completely out of context to people who are sitting on their couches who are just waiting to pounce on stuff online, right? And they weren't there. Um, because, and a lot of those people have never seen the world. They've never been out in a place and understand. But it's also so people can enjoy the experience. I mean, I believe me, I'm addicted to my phone. But I think went to go see Chappelle a couple of years ago at the Wang, and they had his bag of phones. And first I was inconvenienced, but then I found myself actually watching the show and enjoying the show and listening to every single word, not just every other joke, and then looking down to see who's texting me or whatever. I enjoyed the hell out of it. Yeah. And, um, but I think people were just isolated in their houses and I think a lot of content was generated out of that. A lot of people are now headlining comics because of the content they generated just in their homes. Mm-hmm. And what they did, like taking the Bo Burnham route and just, who's this weird kid up in his, in his attic playing music, right? Yeah. And he was doing it before COVID, right? And, and uh, I think he made a special um, at his house, a comedy special during COVID. He did, Released yeah. this, you know, special. Uh, but see the amount of content that was out there and I think people appreciate it and I think they, they want to come into places like this and have it be a safe haven. They want to escape their problems. Do you get in trouble for that? The people are, I mean, you must get a lot of complaints from people who don't understand that. Uh, what, from, from people All who come to a show? members who get offended, like... I always tell them, I, got, I don't know what we want me to tell you. It's not, <laughs> comedy's not comfortable. That's the it, thing it's not supposed to be a comfort zone. It's not supposed to be a warm blanket. There's no genres in comedy. If you wanted to have a warm blanket, go listen to some folk music or something yeah. or whatever and just kind of, I don't know. Not, I don't know anything about folk music. Maybe, <laughs> maybe, maybe it's, it's got an edge to it. I don't know. But I, I feel like people want to, they want to listen to stuff and hear stuff that they shouldn't be listening to and they kind of want to, and laughing about something Something they couldn't laugh about at work. Yeah. Right? A joke that's told is like, geez, if you laughed about that at a meeting, uh, you know, you'd, you'd probably get fired, you know? But people are all in on the joke. And, well, they should be. I mean, if you're coming to a comedy club. But there's no genres in comedy. And I think that's a big thing. Yeah. You say folk music. Well, if you want to go see folk music, it doesn't really matter because it's like a. If you want to go see comedy, you don't really know what you want to go see. Well, we, we put on all of our stuff, we put videos up of, of, of the headliners up, and so people have an idea. But I just mean comedy as a whole. There's oh. no, like, genres, really. It's not like... Well, I guess, you know, but there's kind of like, the, you know, there's gross-out comedy, there's, yeah. uh, you know, there's dirty comedy, there's clean comedy, there's... Do you there's... know Colin Kane? He's the really dirty comic. Oh, my God. Colin? I haven't seen Colin in years. He used to, he used to come here all the time when we first opened. When I was 17, he took my phone and called my dad and made me tell the story of how I lost my virginity. <laughs> I was, I'll never forget that one of the times he was here, when Colin was here. Colin's, I, I, haven't, 
<laughs> is he still around? I don't even know. I just remember that moment. He was like, <laughs> he, was like the, he was like the new dice, like for a period of time. And the place would pack out. Yeah. But I remember people coming out, people coming out of the room. They were like purple. Like some people like, like look at you like this with your. I'd be over by the bar. They'd be like, and I knew people with some of the shows, and I'd be like, you know, I would, you know. So I. We, he's probably the dirtiest, I think. I can't think oh, of yeah, he's, uh, I, I can't think of anybody uh, uh, dirtier than him. I mean, there's some there's some people, and listen, I'm no prude. I love all kinds <laughs> of comedy, so it doesn't really, it doesn't really bother me. Yeah. Um, but there's some people who don't, that's not their thing, and they, you know, they're looking for, but we like to have on all our clubs offerings for everybody that attracts all kinds of different people. Look at it. There's, there's sometimes we book like a, someone who's made it on YouTube, um, you know, here on a Tuesday night or a Monday night, and they pack the place out, and there's 300 people falling out of the chairs laughing. And I'm sitting over there like, I don't, what are they laughing at? Yeah. But that's, it's not for me. You know, when we first opened up this club, uh, there was a lot of speculation about it uh, when Norm and I uh, were opening it. And there was a lot of, there were some naysayers out there, uh, some of the more established people in the, in the city who weren't exactly, told you to face they were rooting for you, but they weren't rooting for you, which makes it all the much sweeter. And um, so, you know, where are the people gonna park? They're in a tough part of town. They don't know what they're doing, you know, things, you know, things like that. And, uh, but I remember the Globe, Boston Globe Magazine did a big, like, huge spread on us and opening and the speculation around it and the people talking. And people, people were, were all supportive for the most part. But there was one anonymous comic who said, because I was the, the main booker at the beginning, at the outset. Ryan does it all now and uh, well, most of it. And I remember uh, one of the comics said, they said, comic who preferred to remain nameless because to, to not like have retribution. Like, not we weren't we don't retaliate against anybody. You have your have your opinion, but I'm glad they said it. I wish they put the name to it because I want to thank them. They said um, John Tobin's a nice guy, but uh, we're kind of concerned that his favorite comic is your older brother's favorite comic. That in other words, he's too enmeshed in with the uh, you know the older established Boston comics, and he doesn't really know this whole. But it really it, it reminded me too that. We can't book these places for our, for our likes and our sensibilities. It has to be a place that uh, all people feel welcome, and there's all different kinds of points of view, even points of view we may disagree with. Although I don't know you can disagree with a point of view. So I mean, people say, "Well, I didn't agree with, you know, so and so." Well, you can't not disagree. You may not like them. Yeah. You may not think it's funny, but you're not allowed to disagree with them. That's how they see the world through their eyes and through their experiences. You can't disagree with them. Um, you may not like them, but that, that's fine. Um, but it reminded me like, we're gonna be really intentional on how we book the club, that it's not just for our likes. You know, that we're the arbiter of all good things and good taste and good, yeah. you know. There's a show here, Dirty Disney. Uh, it's here on Friday nights and it kills it. And uh, I stand in the back and I'm like, I don't, Get it, but there are people. It's not a. It's not, it's not aimed at. It. It's yeah. not for me. Mm -hmm. There was, was a a woman, uh, Jess Hilarious. She's from Baltimore. I yeah, guess she started off like a TikTok, and her her brother Desi is a comic in Baltimore. But she developed this comedy act. She worked on it, and she was in here. We fought like hell to get her in here. She had to cancel once, and she came back. She was here the week before Christmas several years ago. I swear to God, every black woman from Boston was here. Two shows sold out on a Tuesday night the week before Christmas. They were falling out of their seats laughing. She was great. Her, her stage yeah. presence and you know the whole thing. Someone said, how was she? I said, she was, she was very good. I said, but she wasn't talking to me. Mm -hmm. She was having this communal experience and sharing it you know, with her fans and, and people who look like her and talk like her. And, and to me, I mean, same thing when you bring, when we've had on occasion, you bring like a a comedian, you know, uh, uh, the guy from Egypt uh, came in. Uh, he lives out in San Francisco now. He was a doctor out in, in Egypt, and he started doing comedy to question the, the Egyptian government. Kind of run out of town. And um, 
So he comes in and does a show in Arabic, or we have someone come in and do a show in Spanish, or in, or in Chinese, which has happened here. I don't speak any of those languages, yeah. but I know, the, I know the sound of laughter. I know the language of laughter. And to see people just enjoying themselves um, and getting, you know, who are maybe homesick, and it's a taste of back home, and you bring them that joy, which is great. I mean, 19, I don't know, 2002, 2003, John Leguizamo did a, his one-man show at the Colonial Theater in Boston. And I get invited by the folks uh, over at the theater to be their guest. It was a Friday night. The place was completely packed. I think that place seats 1,600 people. Completely sold out on Friday night. It was the first and only time uh, in my, of living in Boston that I was a distinct minority at a, at a public event. I'm talking, you know, Games of the Garden, Fenway Park, uh, Gillette Stadium, Broadway shows, comedy shows, you name it. I was one of the only Caucasian people in the crowd. And he broke through the fourth wall at one point and he said, shout to the ground, where are all my Colombians at? And a section went, ah, where are my Venezuelans at? Ah, where are my Puerto Ricans at? And I, it really got me to thinking like, wow, if you, if you do build it, they will come. And it's particularly if you make them feel welcome. Yeah. You know? And so that was kind of that, what that comic said and watching that John Leguizamo show and, and being there for that. Uh, have always kind of have always kind of stuck with me. You got to make people feel welcome, uh, and you got to go outside your comfort zone, and you got to bring people in, and help people, even if it's not your taste, or what makes you laugh out loud. Yeah, but that's it's funny because that's I think the business mindset. Because I'm listening to that and I agree with that 100. percent But then I'm trying to think about it in a way to like comedians. But it's like you kind of have to stick to your shtick when you're a comedian. Stick like, to you, it. You can't go out and try to please everybody when you're a stand-up. It's, it's Same thing with being a, an elected official. There's a lot of elected officials who, who want to be pleasers. They want to please everybody. There's no pleasing, especially in this day and age with social media. You can't please everybody. It's like you're never as popular when you're elected as the day you were elected. It starts going downhill after that, yeah. right? Um, and as soon as you make a decision or do whatever, and I think with comics, I mean, certainly there's people who find this kind of voice. Like Sebastian Maniscalco was doing comedy for 15 years before he made it, you know, in essence. Or, you know, and, and so it takes patience, it takes discipline. Um, and I, you know, sometimes you're gonna work a day job or work overnight. We have comics I see here all the time that they'll help seat people at a, at a club. They'll be door people. They come up that way. or. They do a gig and they got to go work as a security guard in an office tower. Um, but they do whatever it takes, uh, you know, so they can, so they can eat, yeah. pay their rent, but also saw how they can further themselves and, and just continue to be on different stages in front of different folks. It is tough to give advice. Like, I'd like to be like, oh, what do you see in comedians? But it really is just how, how much do you want it? It really is like a hunger. Like, that's what I meant it was starting off when I was talking about, like, I was nervous talking to you until hearing you, your interviews. So I was like, oh, you're really passionate about it. I love if it. If you're not passionate about something, then you're not going to want to do it. Oh, there's people in this business, agents, some club owners, some people. I'm, I always think to myself, why are you still doing this? Mm -hmm. If you don't, you clearly don't like it. This life is so short. <laughs> until somebody tells me differently, this, yeah. this is it. This is what we got, you know. Um, there's, you know, the, uh, my, uh, I have a picture, I have a picture that I keep, I have a little, little office at our house and I keep kind of like special mementos there, you know, marathon, you know, medals or special photos or, uh, my, my, a dictionary that my grandparents gave me when I was like eight years old that still, they signed it in the middle, things that are special, special books, whatever. it's a small little thing and, um, but there's a picture there, and it's, it's, uh, it's unbelievable. In 1980, my grandmother, um, my mother's mother, took me and my sister uh, to, uh, to New York City for a week. Her sister lived down there in Long Island. So we were in the city, United Nations, we did everything, Empire State Building, but we went to the Statue of Liberty. And we have a, I have a picture, it's a little small, little tiny picture, and it's the, it's the Twin Towers, 
two twin towers, uh, my grandmother, my sister, and me. So obviously, we know what happened with the Twin Towers and the thousands of the people lost there. My grandmother died three years later of cancer. My sister died four years later in, a, in an accident. Um, I'm the only one in that picture who's still standing. And it's just by complete good fortune and good luck that I'm still here. So I, you know, I, I look at that not, as a re not in sorrow, uh, but rather in just kind of gratefulness. I'm just really grateful that I still have the opportunity to go out there and kind of try and make some sort of difference in the world. Yeah. I've been given this opportunity, right? I, you know, every time you feel, I feel down every once in a while, I'll go take a glance at it. I'm like, it's not so bad after all, you know? And get off the couch, get out there, experience stuff, put on more shows, be out amongst people. Well, excuse That's what my it's all language, about. but I think a big thing is like, fuck perfect timing. That's something that I'm really, People are waiting for the perfect moment, but there's never a there's perfect, no perfect moment, moment for anything. It's, for anything. If I was gonna have a if I was gonna have a podcast or write a book, I'd call it open the door. Just open the door. If I don't open the door for Dick Doherty, uh, I don't end up working in comedy. Um, when we opened this club uh, ten years ago, before that it was we found it a year and a half or two years beforehand. We were out looking, scouring a place in the seaport. We had no broker with us. We were, was three or four of us walking around. It's a January night, sleeting, cold, uh, uh, morning, excuse me. And we came over the World Trade, Trade Center footbridge and we came in here. The Western was kind of just relatively new. Uh, so we came in to sit in the lobby to, be, to get warm. And I knew about uh, MJ O'Connor's next door. So I said, let's go check that out. It was still like 10.50 in the morning. They were still closed. So walk down and there's a gray door down MJ O'Connor's. So I said, what's in here? So he opened it. The thing opens. It's unlocked. And we walk into this place, this whole shell of just open space. We're like, what is this? And so we got on the phone with a broker. And the next day, we're back here looking at it with the broker. And, and eventually, we had a deal in a couple months. But it was from opening. You know, what's behind that door? Yeah. Open the door, you know, open, just open it. I got in a really bad hockey accident when I was in high school, and I had to lay in my room for a month. I had to take medical leave off of Yikes. school. I couldn't go outside. I couldn't listen to music. I couldn't watch TV. All I could do was listen to people talk, so I just listened to stand-up and podcasts for huh. 30 days straight. Wow. And then after that, when I came through, I was like, oh, this is, you know, through line. One of the podcasts I listened to, was Kill Tony. This is when Kill Tony oh, first started. It's my favorite. Really? Love it. So listen to this. This is yeah. some craziness about opening the door. I'm serious. First, I'll go even farther back than that. I won tickets from Laugh Boston to Oddball Comedy Festival. Out of the Mansfield? To backstage passes. I, I probably saw you there. I won was that the one with Sarah, uh, Sarah Silverman on it? And Michelle Wolf? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So I won those tickets. I brought my dad. It was the first event I did after getting in this accident. Because we booked the small stage at that. Yes, Brody Stevens, rest in peace, oh. hosted it. Oh my God. Brody Stevens hosted it. Yeah. And I talked to him that night. So that's how I found out about Kill Tony. Weird, Brody Stevens. Yeah. I go, I'm 18 at this point, and I want to go do stand up. My mom buys me a fake ID. And I go out to LA and I put my name in the bucket on episode 70 of Kill Tony. And I used, I got to use my That was at the, at the comedy store. At the comedy store, and I got to do stand up for the first time ever in the comedy store on Kill Tony. Episode like 70. Unreal. Brody Stevens was in that room, rest in peace, but that was the whole reason I found out about that. And then when I came back, I started coming to the. How'd you do it? I killed. If you watch it, it's online. Uh, yeah, Jamar Neighbors and Mike Lawrence are the guests. I did really, really And that's well. when he had the old band, uh, Jet Ski Johnson. Yeah, this was, no, this was uh, Jeremiah Watkins. Jeremiah Watkins. And um, I forget the other guy. And this was in the belly room. Yes. Yeah, in the belly room. And then I got to I, do the main stage Kill Tony a year later with Steve-O. And that was my third time ever doing stand-up. But opening the door, I was like, my mom was like, can you find a place to get a fake ID so you can go do Kill Tony? 
And now Tony knows who I am. Like that's just. Tony, I mean, we've had Tony here uh, several times and go in the back room and, you know, he, one show he had William Montgomery, Hans, Kim, and David Lucas and him, and I felt like I was in my, like I popped into my, my phone, I'm listening to the podcast, and I love it. I, lo I can't wait for Mondays when it drops. I just think it's such an interesting concept, and one minute, one minute of the comedy, as you know, is yeah. tough to do. It's way harder than five. <laughs> it's way harder than five. <laughs> way harder than an hour. It's, I've done an hour. It, it is hard. hard. And then, you know, <laughs> people like Hans and William and, and David Lucas is retired from the show now, but he'll pop in. But to, every week to come out and do another minute of fresh material to do that. And then the people that pull out of the thing and just the, I mean, they all pulled out of a, a hat. You basically get pulled out of a hat. But there's some people, there was a kid on the other day who was unreal. I don't know if you heard the last episode. Kid was on the young kid. Yes. Yeah. The twenty-one-year-old. Yeah. yeah. He got, and he'd been there. That was his twelfth time being there, and he finally got picked. And now he's got like the golden ticket, and they want him back. And you know, and um, yeah, it's an amazing concept. But people just hey, I'm gonna put my name in, and I'm gonna stand there and, and see if I get picked, and and then I'm gonna shoot my shot. Would you ever do it? No, I, at this point, no. Sixty seconds. Oh, I. <laughs> I'd be, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 mean, I have so many funny stories and things that have happened in comedy and uh, experiences, and, um, and I love telling stories, but uh, I don't know if it could be condensed into, into, into one minute, you know? What, uh, what business tips would you give for a comedian? Um, you know, just uh, stage... Stage experience is important. Don't be taken advantage of, though. Don't get taken advantage of. You know, if uh, you know if they're charging full, you know, uh, full boat on the tickets, and you're only getting five dollars or whatever, you know, don't be afraid to ask a couple of questions. What's going on? You know, especially in some of the, you know some of the the, the smaller shows. Um, just be careful. Just be. Don't take advantage of, and don't. Uh, there's all kinds of people who are going to try and sell you dreams, you know. I know this one, I know that one. You're just going to chart your own course and just stay true to yourself and what you want to do. And, and don't get discouraged by, you know, if you, everybody bombs. Everybody bombs. If you, if you don't bomb, you're not doing something right. Like if you're killing it, and, but also don't tell me you've killed it every night, you know. And, I've, I've killed it every, you know, 10 nights in a row. It's like, all right, let's, let's know the proper definition of killing. You know, it's just sort of like, I'll, I'll show you someone who, who kills. But be patient. It's a process. It just, just be patient. And sometimes I'm not patient. It's one of my worst virtues is patience. I, but I've had to, I guess particularly as I've been married and I've had have kids and just got to be patient. You know, and things. If you do what you need to be need to be done, everything's going to work out just fine. You know, but just stay true to who you are. But don't let people take advantage of you. You know, and just chart your own course. There are people that, that sincerely want to help. They really are. But just be. Don't be afraid to ask questions of other people. Hey, ask for recommendations. You know, what do you think about so and so? Uh, and a business, have you done business with them? Just ask for references before you jump in with somebody. I think is, uh, I think is pretty important, particularly for younger comics, yeah. you know? At the end of the day, you, you can know the booker, you can know the club owner, but we have people all the time, you know, I wanna get on one of your stages, so send us some clips, you know, send us some, we just don't put anybody on stage. Uh, we have places like that for folks, you know, to work, work out rooms. The only way you get better is doing the mics and, and doing the pre-produced shows and the, you know, the, I mean, the produced shows like Will does at Capo for us. And it just, just, but enjoy the process. And enjoy, like, the people around you. Don't get in rivalries with other comics. That they're all trying to do the same thing. And, you know, comedy beef is horrible. I really uh, don't it like is, it. It's... I always talked about it on this podcast. When I started Bucked Up, someone yeah. else started a podcast just talking shit about my podcast. I was like, what? Well, you really think? And now if he did that, now he'd get listeners. 
But, but he did this when that one. Yeah, but Sam, listen, take, take it as a badge of honor. Isn't that fun? Take it as a badge of honor. It's, it's like, like people like, like people, people get made fun of in Saturday Night Live. It's sort of like it's like a badge of honor. They people know who you are. Oh yeah. They know who. There's always gonna be trying people gonna ride the coattails or be negative or. You, you just, just laugh, laugh at them. them. You, you just can't laugh get at them. About I used to read. There used to be the comedy studio. Used to have a thing called the Kvetch Board. <laughs> this is the early days of the internet. You know, dial up and stuff. And I used to read it. I'd never post it on. I didn't put a profile. I just read it. And I just could not believe the amount of time and energy that was wasted on these silly, silly fights and arguments and this and that and like. So ninety-five percent of it was just. But it was like it was like voyeuristic, just kind of reading it and kind of. And then that's it's like Facebook now. Yeah. Boston comedian Facebook group. I see it. I see it. I don't like. I don't look funny. Either. I don't like. I, I I'll see it if I don't. I don't go looking for it, but I'll see it. And and hey, whatever. And people and there's people who try and drag us into the muck sometimes, or this this one or that. And I just you just you just gonna gonna do your own thing. You acknowledge it. I mean, if someone has a legitimate gripe, and it happens in business and happens in life, then. You try and deal with it, but if there's people just being negative for the sake of being negative or trying to boost their own kind of thing, you know, eventually uh, that will that will kind of run its course. People know negative energy when they have it, and when when someone when they see it and they hear it, and eventually that kind of like peters out. People really don't want to be around that. They want to be around people who make them smile and make them laugh and when they enjoy stuff. You know, when you think that there's like uh, there's only so many slices of the pizza, that's when the negative energy, because then it's like a rat race for the top of a, a hill that's not even existed. Yeah. And then there's a mountain next to that hill that you're not even looking at. You're not even looking and at. And then that's there's not even there's something next to that. Yeah, you're sitting there watching them at the top of the mountain. Oh, they got that, and I didn't get you know. But me, yeah, you're right. There's a territory that you're kind of not painted. It hasn't been conquered yet. Yeah. Go after that one. Go after that one. Everybody, I think there's room. Listen, I, but there's a lot of people. There's, all, there's, there's like the top one percenters in, e in every business, you know, in every, certainly with comics who are selling out arenas and stadium stuff. But wow, there's a ton of work in comics like yourself that are out there grinding it out in clubs. When I go to a, I love, when I, I have to travel a fair amount, so I love being in a place where nobody knows who I am. And I can go into a comedy club. It can be a, it can be a bucket of blood. It can be, it can be a nicer place, and just sit in the back and have myself a couple of IPAs and just watch comedy for the joy of it. But I, I was in Colorado, uh, for work earlier in the summer. I was in Fort Collins. So there's a play, a comedy club that's run by comics. And then, me and the guy that I was with, we went in, and uh, kid Stephen Rogers was up there, and I had heard of him. I knew him before. I think he. I never had more fun at a comedy show ever in my life. He was awesome. And the two comics who own the place do a thing, a routine together at the beginning, they were terrific. It was like a great experience. And the place, I only sat 130 people, but it was like a nice, intimate place. And at the time of my life in there. Um, and then, you know, we're in, Norm and I were in Oklahoma City or, or Wichita uh, last summer. And we go into places, and the guy, uh, the raging Cajun, this guy from Louisiana, I've, I've never, never seen anything like it before. He destroyed for an hour. Just destroyed. Uh, this guy, John, John Morgan. And then I asked some people, you know, they're like, oh yeah, the raging Cajun, yeah. They're like, I've never heard of him before, you know? And you find these gems, but those are the people that just work in their territory, grind it out, and just bring in joy to people. You do have to see what you want. You have to just look and see, all right, that's the person that I kind of see their career path. Yeah, you don't have to. Why, why should success be measured in if you sold out the Boston Garden or not? Why can't you make a decent living, have a mortgage, pay your rent, or put food on the table and just be happy? You know, I think for anything. I think it's and not just comedy, but it's just for anything. But everybody's just trying to, you know, do you see that hunger in the people, though, that you do know they're going to make it to the next level? Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's going to be a, you have to, listen, there's no denying, you, you need a hunger. I was listening to a podcast recently, uh, Smartless, and John McEnroe was on. And he's just talking about the drive, what it takes, and they were asking about his own kids if they play tennis. He says, 
Well, that's, that's, that's kind of a, you know, if you want to, uh, we'll call it that, loosely call it playing tennis. He said, but they don't, he said, I think they suffer from a little bit of apathy and kind of, you know, they've grown up with a lot. And there's really, what's the hunger to really like, kind of the drive. But then there's other people who come from a lot who kind of give it up and they chart their own course. And I mean, there's a, there's someone in Boston comedy right now whose parents are very, very, very well to do but they're out there charting their own course, and they're doing it, and they have my greatest admiration uh, for what they're doing under a different name, and they just, and I have so much respect for them, because they just have a real, gave up their day job, and they just got this passion, and this hunger, and this desire. That's what it, if you don't have the desire, then it's just not gonna, it's not gonna happen for you. Would you want your kids to be do comedy, or would you try to talk them out of it? No, I'd want them to do whatever makes them happy. I, I think it would be great. I mean, my, uh, they're both completely different personalities. They both have uh, kind of different senses of humor, but uh, they're both smart kids, um, very fortunate, they're healthy. It's, I, I have no complaints. So whatever they're looking to do, uh, I'd be happy if my, my about to be 16 year old you know, he's turned 16 in two weeks. He's coming here uh, Thanksgiving weekend. He's bringing 12 of his friends, and they're going to go see Jimmy Cash. Oh, that's he loves awesome. Jimmy Cash, and Jimmy loves him, Daddy, and so. But for his birthday, he wants a DJ kit because he wants to be a DJ. You know, because um, I, I get a. If he needs any help with that, I know some really good DJs. I'm sure you do. Well, I have a guy, who, a guy who works with me uh, in Northeast, and his name is uh, Shimeli Okitas. And he's real P, and he's nominated again for best DJ in the city. Oh, that's and he's great. DJing all over the city. He's doing um, my friend uh, Tommy McIntyre, who uh, his brother's Joe from the New Kids, and Tommy's son Liam is now goes to Alabama, and he's a DJ. And I see these pictures, and he's DJing parties in Alabama as a freshman for like a thousand kids, all dressed in you know in crimson. And he's up on stage, and Joe played the Cape Cod Melody to the summer, and he DJed during the thing. And so Danny sees that, and he's like, and so Chase, yeah, go to so my wife. said, should we buy this? I said, he seems to have a passion for it. He's dedicated to it, so let him pursue it. And if he does it for a year or two, and he sold sneakers for two years. And he did well with that. He just, you know, let him find what they, what they want to do. Yeah, but if they want to, I don't know if I'd want to listen to it the first couple of times, you know. Let them find their voice. I mean, there's so many comics. Like, has your family come to see you? Yeah, they love, they want to support me, but I don't think they like what I talk about. <laughs> yeah. You know, my sense of humor, I think, is a little too blue for my family. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Sometimes people are like, I always, you know, I know some comics, and I'm sure you do too, that their parents have never seen them. Or maybe they waited like seven or eight years and until they saw their name in the paper or they saw that they were going to be on a late night show. It's like, oh, this is for real. You know? The first time, I have a picture with the first time my parents have seen each other since I graduated college was my first night headlining Nick's, and I have a picture with both of them, because they both came to that Friday night. That was the first time they were together since they Together since my college graduation, yeah. That's and awesome. They're divorced. They have yeah, yeah. They don't really want to see each other. I got you. So they were there, and then my mom came to both shows, the Friday and the Saturday. But it's really cool. I got a picture with both of them at Nick's. I never thought I'd get a picture of both of them again. That's an awesome story. Yeah, that's really great. cool that they came to that. They were very happy. They were very happy. Oh, I'm sure they were, yeah. yeah. Oh, to celebrate you. That's, wow, that's <laughs> awesome. That's, <laughs> brings a little tear to my eye. <laughs> it was, I think they've seen, I think they support me because I, ever since that hockey accident, was, they took me to the Melody Tent to see Jim Gaffigan on my 10th birthday. That was the first comedy show I ever went to. How great is that? It's always been in my life. You know, yeah, it's yeah. Been in my blood. Yeah. But, Man, I really do appreciate you doing that. Oh, Sam, yeah. I, th thank you. Unknowingly, you've really shaped my life in a lot of ways. So I appreciate you, and I appreciate you. Uh, thanks, for thanks for always coming in. in. That means a lot to me. I appreciate it. And, you know, just try and do it for someone else. And just, you know, it, you just sometimes you just don't realize that, you know, there's a lot of people out there watching and, and seeing how people, you know, their actions. And I've certainly have had the great benefit of having so many mentors in my life. You know, people my high school principal and different bosses and different people and different, uh, who if you've got the photo all in the same room, they probably argue with each other, but you take different little facets from each of them and you can learn a lot from people when they do things the right way. You can also learn from people who don't, things, don't do things the right way and you, and you have a diagnosis of that. That's really not the right way to be doing that, but 
So, but you can learn from them. It doesn't mean. Hey, actually, that's what this whole podcast is about. If I can do it, if anyone's watching this and sees that I can do it, they can definitely do it too. That's the. No, I listen. I appreciate you always coming in here when you were a kid and uh, and pursuing your passion and and choosing us and uh, and then going and charting your own course and. I think it's wonderful, and clearly uh, the audience agrees with the half a million followers. That's uh, <laughs> the empty audience. Yeah, the empty audience. Yeah, but uh, out there, out there in the uh, in the in the, in the yeah. webverse or whatever it's called. So, congratulations and, and thanks for everything. I appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you very much. Right, we'll end it there. Right. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah.